Father God, we stand here before you, giving you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. For in you, Father God, you are our righteousness. Christ Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He came down to this earth, became flesh, walked a blameless life, was cast aside by the earth, by the world, and nailed up to a cross. All for us. The amount of love that was shown that day. It's, it's unfathomable. Christ Jesus' blood covers our sins, covers a multitude of sins. And that is the most gracious gift that you could have given us, Father. Today, as we continue on in our service, I pray a blessing over everyone here, over everyone watching, and I pray a blessing over the words that are about to be spoken, Father. I pray that they touch the hearts and the minds of those who need to hear them. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church family. Good morning. That was decent. We're going to do it again, though. Good morning, church family. Good morning. There's even better. Larissa, you're on top of it. I love it. She's still got some left in the tank after singing this morning. It's uh, good to be here with you all. If you're visiting, we want to say welcome to Northampton Christian Church. When you leave, uh, please see the welcome desk. They have a little uh, handout for you. They'd love to give you a little gift for just saying thanks for coming and stopping by. If you're watching online, we're glad you're tuning in and glad to have all of you here in person as well. Uh, this morning, as we get going... Um, uh, before we do, I guess I want to just kind of pause for a moment and just pray and get our hearts right, including uh, my own, as we get ready to start into the Word this morning. So let's bow with our heads for a moment and pray to the Lord. Jesus, it is good to be in your house today. It is good to see uh, one another after not seeing each other for maybe a whole week. Um, but Lord, we're so grateful that we get to be encouraged by being a church family. You knew what you were creating when you made the church, and we get to be here and encourage one another, love on each other as we learn the good and the bad and everywhere in between throughout the week. And we get to come here and be the family that you've called us to be for one another. And I pray, Jesus, this morning as we dig into your word that you would help transform us from the inside out as we're looking ultimately to look more like you, Jesus. That's the goal and effort in this life once we've given our lives to you is to follow you, Jesus, as a Lord and Savior and to look more like you with each passing day. Jesus, I pray that you would forgive me my sins so that I might be a clean vessel to bring your word this morning. And I pray that anything good that comes from the service today, that you alone would get the glory for it. And we look forward to digging into your word and what you prepared for us. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray all these things. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So we are going through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're learning about the life and ministry of Jesus, the way it really happened. Last week, we looked at a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus, 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 he welcomed his investigation just like he welcomes anyone's investigation of him today. Jesus told Nicodemus that he and everyone else must be born again, born of water and the spirit, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which we also know to be the kingdom of God. This means that a person must spiritually be born again, and this happens when a person is baptized, being raised into new life with Jesus, beginning the transformative work inside out where the Holy Spirit is making us into the image of Jesus. We also learned as a follower of Jesus, he doesn't want us to just be a fan of his, sitting in the bleachers, cheering him on, saying, yay, Jesus, with a big foam finger. Rather, he calls us, his disciples, to get into the game. And so that left us for a challenge last week to consider how we might be able to get plugged in and be the church family with the hands and feet here at Northampton and how that might encourage us to think about things and getting plugged in with the needs here. That takes us to our text today, and we're going to be in John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles or the Bible app with you, please turn there, and that's where we're going to be hanging out today, just in John chapter 4. Setting the context for us a little bit, after speaking with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples, they baptized people for the same purpose as John the Baptist, a baptism of repentance that made people ready for the Messiah who brought salvation and the new covenant way to be saved. So many people at this point in time are coming to Jesus. The word's out of the bag, and he's now getting a lot of people coming, and they're being baptized and becoming his disciples. And these disciples, they now outnumber John the Baptist's disciples. 
And people are seeing this, including the Pharisees. They're saying, whoa, John the Baptist had all these guys, but now Jesus, this guy, he has all these other disciples following him. So the Pharisees, they catch wind of this, and that means they're probably going to want to go stir up some trouble. Jesus, learning about this, says, okay, I think it's time for us to move on from this area to try to delay the interaction I'm going to have with these Pharisees. So he felt that it was good to go from Judea down to Galilee, and that's where we'll pick up with our text this morning, starting in verse 4. It says, now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I appreciate the author John's inclusion of the little details in parentheses because it helps all of us understand the whole picture better. The last parenthetical inclusion here, it says that Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Naturally, we ask, well, why not? What's the issue? Jews did not associate with Samaritans because Samaritans were part Israelite and part Gentile. Long story short, after the reign of King Solomon in 931 BC, Israel, they were divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. The northern kingdom's ruling city was Samaria, and that was conquered, and its people were sent into exile in, by Assyria in 721 B.C. Now, in this exile, many of the godly leaders of the northern kingdom of Israel were removed from the land, and the ungodly king of Assyria, he replaced them with ungodly foreign rulers who brought with them many pagan and foreign gods. God instructed the Israelites very seriously not to marry these ungodly foreigners because these foreigners, they worship false gods instead of him, and God did not want his people, the Israelites, nor their potential offspring to be persuaded to worship these false gods. Unfortunately, many of the Jews from Samaria, they disobeyed and married these foreigners who did not worship God anyway. These mixed marriages then gave birth to mixed children, and these mixed children, they were called Samaritans. They were the result of ungodly marriage, and they were referred to as unclean half-breeds by the Jews. Serious conflict inevitably arose between the Samaritans and the Jews, so much so that the Samaritans, they eventually built their own place of worship to worship God on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, while the Jews had their temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans, they rejected the Old Testament except for the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and they also rejected many of the Jewish traditions. And because of their disobedience and defiant differences, the Jews hated and shunned the Samaritans. They viewed the Samaritans as the worst of all the human race, which naturally caused then the Samaritans to hate them back. And you see how there could be this clash then, right? I personally, I love a good rivalry. As an Ohio State Buckeye fan, we have a sports rivalry with a team in the state directly above us that we only refer to as that team up north. It's bragging rights for a whole year for the team who wins the, national, the, the annual showdown. And there's a lot of silliness involved in the rivalry where Ohio State fans we aren't supposed to wear blue and yellow since it's the rival's team colors. And we will call each other enemies and other names. And some fans, they do take it too far. But all in all, the rivalry is just for fun. It's born out of a game that college students play for our entertainment. And I can proudly be friends with Greg and Debbie Van Buskirk this morning, even though they root for that wrong team, okay? (laughs) But what you have to understand here this morning is that this Jew versus Samaritan thing, it wasn't just a rivalry. They actually hated each other, and they posed physical threats to one another. The first century Jewish historian Josephus, he even recorded a violent quarrel between some Galilean Jews and Samaritans while the Galileans were traveling through Samaria. This animosity between the Jews and Samaritans, it had been around for centuries at the time that Jesus meets this Samaritan woman at the well. The hate, it was real. It was deeply embedded and it even determined the routes that Jews traveled on. There's a map that I want you to look at behind me. And you see three routes on this map that a Jew could take when they go from Judea in the north to Galilee in the south. So you have the one that's like a greenish turquoise, you have a white, and then you have a red. You guys see those this morning? Okay. So the shortest route was the middle white route. 
But this route went through Samaria's area and the city of the Samaritans. As an intentional put down to Samaritans and to avoid potential harm, Jews, they would not travel on this middle, white, and shortest route. Instead, they would take either the western route or the eastern route, which would add between two to seven days of travel time. Back then, people mostly walked everywhere. And to add days of walking to your trip to avoid a people group and place, that shows us that there was serious animosity between the Jews and Samaritans. This wasn't just a rivalry thing. This was for real. But Jesus here, he chooses instead to take the middle white route, and he wants to specifically go right into Samaria, where the Jews normally avoid it. And while his disciples no doubt would have had a strong knee-jerk reaction to taking this route through Samaria, they obey Jesus, and they went into the town of Sychar to get some food, leaving Jesus for his next interaction with this woman. Jesus, he goes to the well that the biblical forefather Jacob had dug many years before. And tired from traveling, he sits down, and a Samaritan woman approaches the well. A well or a spring, it was kind of like the town gate. It was a site where people congregated. The Samaritan woman, she came by herself, which we'll address in a little bit why she might have come by herself. And Jesus asks this woman if she would be willing to give him a drink of the water that she was drawing up from the well. She is presumably shocked by this request for a few reasons. First... She recognizes Jesus to be a Jew, likely from his speech and appearance, and she knew that Jews and Samaritans, remember, they hated each other. So why would Jesus, a Jew, be talking to her, a Samaritan, let alone sitting there in a Samaritan city? Second, it was culturally unacceptable for a man to speak with a woman privately. Third, if Jesus, if he drank from her drinking vessel, then he risked defilement because she was a woman who could have been menstruating and because some saw it as a defilement to eat or drink after Samaritan. So there's a lot of culturally and some potentially religious taboo things that Jesus is doing here. Jesus, of course, he knows this, and he chooses to proceed and share with her his reason for visiting anyway. Let's go to the next couple of verses. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our forefather Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to this well or to draw some water. The gift of God that Jesus is referring to here is salvation, eternal life in heaven. She doesn't know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, or else he says that she would instead be asking him for what he can offer, the salvation that leads to eternal life. Like we talked about last week, the Greek word for water is hudor, and in some places it is used figuratively. And we know when it is used figuratively because we normally see the phrase living water, just like we do in the passage here this morning. And so Jesus uses the phrase living water to describe a spiritual need. He's not talking about physical water here. The Samaritan woman doesn't understand that Jesus, uh, she doesn't understand Jesus yet as she keeps talking about physical water, thinking that's what he's talking about. Jesus continues then by contrasting physical needs with spiritual needs, and he points out that a person's physical need for water is continuous, and they'll have to keep drinking physical water day after day to survive, just like all of us. But he contrasts that with the living water that he alone offers, which is only needed once, and that lasts for eternity. The Samaritan woman, she still doesn't understand as she asks Jesus, well, where can I get this water to satisfy all my daily physical water needs? She doesn't understand that Jesus wants to make her aware of her spiritual need and that he alone is the answer. And I think there are a lot of people out there living today that choose not to think about or they don't want to acknowledge their spiritual need, let alone that Jesus is the answer. People who are spiritually lost, they can try to convince themselves that if they can just take care of their day-to-day physical needs and everything, it's going to be all right. It's fine. If I have food, if I have water, if I have a house, if I have clothes, if I can pay the bills, if I have a job, if I have a vehicle, if I can meet that special someone, if I can take care of my kids, if I can take care of my spouse, if I can stay healthy, if I can save up for retirement, if I can just take care of all the physical things, 
then I'm all good and I don't need anything else. I'm good to go. But man, you're not all good. You got it all wrong. If you have all the physical things taken care of, but you don't have Jesus, then in reality, you actually have nothing. When your body physically fails you and you die, you'll no longer be in control of what happens next. I urge you, stop looking down at the things of this world, thinking that this, your entire existence is all there is, or that your answers to your deepest needs can be found in meeting just the physical needs of this life. Instead, start looking up to the only one who gives life and life to the full. Not only can Jesus meet your physical needs here in this earth, he also takes care of your deepest need, your spiritual need, salvation. He's the one that offers that. No one else can. And so, so many times in this life, we can get distracted looking at the things down here thinking, if I got this taken care of, I'm good. Jesus said, look to me who gives you everything you actually need. Not only can Jesus meet your physical needs here on earth, he's the only one that can meet your much greater spiritual need when you leave this earth. And Christians, I implore you this morning, don't get sucked back into the distractions of this life that can rob you from fulfilling your purpose God's called you to. Don't focus so much on the earthly things that you become numb to or stop prioritizing your focus on heavenly things that matter so much more now in light of eternity. Like the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, set your minds where? On things above, not on earthly things. For you died, remember? And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Physical needs are important. And your heavenly father, he knows that you need them. He's not dumb. He knows what you need. But most importantly, each of us has at the very core of our personal being a spiritual need that affects our eternity. And only Jesus can meet that greatest need. Matthew 6, says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus tells us to first, above all else, to continuously seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and then everything else will work out. God's going to take care of that. But he says, look to me for the thing you actually need. All this other stuff, that's easy. I can fix that just like that. But you need what I can only give in a way that you can't get from anything else that you're focused on. Only focus on me. Jesus alone is has been and will always be the answer for both our eternal and daily spiritual needs. And when this life is over, folks, all that's going to matter is did we choose and trust Jesus to meet our much greater spiritual needs? Have you? If not, then please, let's talk about that sometime. Jesus, he's, he's about to shock the Samaritan woman again. Look at what he says next. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands. And the man, you're now have, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Typically, each day, women in the town would come to draw water from the well in the morning so they could avoid the noonday heat. And women would often go to the well together in groups to draw this water, making the well a social gathering where the women would get together and talk. The Samaritan woman did not come in the morning. Instead, she came in the noonday heat, and she came alone. She did this because the women and the rest of the town, they knew about her past and her current sin, and she probably was the topic of gossip and shunned by the other ladies. She was an outcast in her own town. To avoid these women and their gossip, the Samaritan woman, she came alone when no one else would be there. But on this day, Jesus is there. And Jesus supernaturally reveals that he also knows about her sin. He knows that she has a morally messy past, having had five husbands, and that she currently is living in sin as she lives with a man who is not her husband. And probably with great astonishment, the Samaritan woman confirms, wow, you're dead on, that's right. What I want to point out from this text is that Jesus, he is not phased by the Samaritan woman's sin. He knows what she's done. He's not excusing it. He knows what she's done and what she is currently doing, but he pursues her anyway. I've talked to many people and heard even more stories of when people are confronted with Jesus and they reflect on their spiritual past, 
they typically come to one of two wrong conclusions. Either Jesus won't save them because they're so sinful or that Jesus can't save them because they're so sinful. Both of those things are wrong. And if that's you here this morning, I need you to lean in right now. Jesus absolutely can save you. In fact, he's the only one who can. God very purposefully sent his son Jesus, who lived a perfect life, to die on a cross as our substitute. You and I and everyone in this world, we all deserve to go to hell because we have sinned against a holy God. Us going to hell, it satisfies God's justice as a holy, righteous, sinless God. But, one of his equally great, but out of his equally great love for you and me, not wanting us to go to hell and instead be with him for eternity, God gave up his throne, humbled himself by coming to earth he created as a human being, God in the flesh, and he lived a perfect, sinless life, and he died a sinner's death so he could save anyone who, si- who chooses to be saved and follow him. Any sinner says, Jesus, you are now Lord and Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way, and he has personally made that way possible for anyone that submits to him. That's good news, because that means that includes all of us, no matter our messy past, no matter where we're at now. Jesus is still the answer, and he makes the way, and he is pursuing you and me today. One time I was talking with someone, and they were having a hard time understanding the complete ability that God has to forgive sin. They had clung to this wrong understanding that while Jesus can forgive some sins, sure, he can't forgive or he won't forgive all of them, even if a person begs and asks him for complete forgiveness. I looked them straight in the face and I said, if Adolf Hitler, if Adolf Hitler, after murdering those millions of Jews, if he would have gotten down on his knees, repented for all his sins and obeyed the gospel for salvation, Jesus would have saved them just as quick as he has saved anyone else. Their jaw about hit the floor in disbelief. But folks, this is the truth. This is how deep Jesus' forgiveness goes. It's complete. And while we might think that might be unfair, it's not unfair in Jesus' book. Why? Because his love trumps whatever you or I have done. He loves you desperately. And I need you to understand that today. Nothing you have done is too much or too great that Jesus can't forgive you from it. He absolutely can God tells us when we choose salvation in him, as far as the east is from the west, think about that, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, our sins from us. See, he doesn't associate our sins with us anymore when we're saved by him. It's not a big deal. It's it's not a thing anymore. And even here's better news, I think, than even that. Not only can Jesus save you, But his whole point in coming to this earth in the first place was because he wants to save you. Yeah, you. He thinks you are worth it. 2 Peter 3.9 says he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone, not just some people, everyone to come to repentance. Isn't that good news? That means nobody's an outcast in his book. That means all of us are able to be saved. And not only can he do it, but he wants to do it because he loves and wants you. And remember the passage we looked at last week in John 3, 17? It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came, but to save the world through him. And what does the, world, the word world mean here? It means everyone. Jesus wants to forgive every one of their sins so that the entire world will be saved. That's his, that's his job. That's what he wants. Jesus can forgive sins, Jesus wants to forgive sins, and Jesus will forgive your sins if you obey the gospel for salvation and follow him. What good news that is this morning. The Lord says in Isaiah 118, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. There is no sin that you have done or will do that Jesus cannot save you from. He is not phased by our sin. He has seen it all, heard it all, and he knows all that you've done, just like he knew all that the Samaritan woman had done before. And just like the Samaritan woman, he is pursuing you. He wants to make you aware of your greatest need, your spiritual need to be cleansed from your sins, and he wants you to know that he's already done everything to make that possible for you. 
All that's left is for you to choose and submit to him, obeying the gospel for salvation so you can confidently know when you draw your last breath, hey, brother, sister, hey, family, I know where I'm going. Jesus has taken away my sins, and I'm going to be with him for eternity. Anyone want to say hallelujah this morning? That's good news, folks. The Samaritan woman, she doesn't grasp everything that's happening, so she continues to dialogue with Jesus, and she says in John 4, 20, she says, our ancestors, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews, you claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Perhaps out of embarrassment of her revealed sin or in genuine desire to have a question answered, the Samaritan woman, she changes the topic and she, as she asks Jesus where she should worship God. The temple in Samaria or the temple in Jerusalem? Which one, God? Jesus reveals a new and deeper need to her, however. He reveals to her that what really matters is not the place where someone worships God. Rather, it's about how someone worships God. God tells her that in the future, and we know this to mean after his crucifixion and resurrection, correct worship will not be at either temple. In fact, there would be no exclusive site to worship God. Soon everyone who wants to follow and worship the one true God can do so with equal access to him because worship is actually not confined to a place, rather it has always been about a person's heart towards God. True followers of God will worship him in spirit and in truth. And this idea, this concept, it harkens back to what we learned in the very first sermon I preached here. And it comes from, it comes from the prayer and the commandment we follow and learned about called the Shema. Do you remember? For those of you who were here, the Shema was the central prayer of Jewish life. And it was also the greatest commandment that God gave for his people. Jesus quoted it in Mark 12 where he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. So to worship God in spirit and truth necessarily involves loving him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. With everything you've got is what Jesus is saying. That's how you worship me in spirit and truth. And Jesus makes that even more obvious by stating that he is doing away with the religious Jewish rituals and with worship at the temple. True worship must be in spirit. That is engaging a person's entire heart, everything that you are. Unless there's a real passion for God, there's no worship in spirit. At the same time, worship must be in truth, meaning you must be properly informed of who God is so you can then in turn worship him correctly. If you don't know about him, how can you worship him, right? That's what it's meaning here. Unless we have knowledge of the God we worship, there's no worship in truth. Both are necessary, spirit and truth, for God-honoring worship. Spirit without truth leads to a shallow, overly emotional experience that could be compared to like a high someone gets. As soon as the emotion is over, when the fervor cools down, the worship ends. You're done because you don't feel it anymore. On the other side of things, truth without spirit can result in a dry, passionless encounter that can easily lead to a form of joyless legalism. Now, the best combination of both aspects of worship that Jesus wants for you and I results in a joyous appreciation of God informed by Scripture. The more we know about God, the more we appreciate him. The more we appreciate him, the deeper our worship of him. The deeper of our, our worship of him, the more God is glorified. That's what it means to worship God in spirit and truth. Does that make sense this morning? Not totally understanding all this, the Samaritan woman, she responds by saying, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus just had a mic drop moment. <laughs> you can see that? Everything in their conversation has been leading up to this point. Jesus breaks down the social, cultural, and religious barriers with this woman. He tries to help her recognize her greatest need, her spiritual need, and he tells her that he alone fulfills that need with the gift of eternal life. Jesus proves his, Jesus proves his now revealed identity by sharing his supernatural knowledge of her messy and sinful past. Unfazed by her sin, Jesus continues to pursue her, telling her that a new and best way to worship God is coming that is available to her and to everyone who lives. And that isn't, this, that isn't this something that she will have to wait for any longer because all along she has been talking to the Messiah, the one who has come to fulfill all of this. Let's look at these next few passages together. It says, just then, 
his disciples returned, and he was, they were surprised to see him speaking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him, towards Jesus. Many of the Samaritans from that town, they believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him, please stay with us. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. We, now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man, Jesus, he really is the savior of the world. The disciples, they recognized the cultural taboo Jesus was engaged in, him talking with a woman alone, but they trust Jesus to know what's best in the situation. Good job, disciples, right? And then we see the reaction of the Samaritan woman, and it is beautiful. She simply came to the well that day to get her daily need of physical water. But now she leaves behind that water jar because she has met the one who offers living water. And she goes into her hometown, a town that knows and labels her only for her sin. And instead of trying to avoid people because of her sin, she now boldly shares with them all that Jesus knows all about her sin. And he has offered her, in fact, he offers everyone the thing they need most, a way to eternal life. After seeing the joy, transparency, and hope that now fills this once sinful, shame-filled, avoided, outcast of society, people come to investigate this Jesus who claims to fulfill their deepest need. And for some, because of this woman's testimony, and for others, after hearing Jesus' teaching for the next two days, many of the Samaritans, they come and they follow Jesus, rightly believing him to be the Savior of the world. That is a beautiful picture, folks. She came wanting to get something physical. She leaves knowing that she has what she needs most, the spiritual. And now she doesn't care what people think about her. She no longer is ashamed to go talk to people face to face. It doesn't matter because she met the one who fixes everything. And Jesus is still doing that for you and me today. Who cares about the past? I've got Jesus. Do you? That is a good thing. And this woman is recognizing it. And she says, you guys got to come and see. Because this Jesus, he changes everything. Jesus uses the most unlikely people to fulfill his work, doesn't he? This woman, with her past sin and current sinful situation, the outcast of the town, Jesus chooses to use her. He knew that this Samaritan woman would react the way she did, and because of it, he, choose, he chose to, her to play a special role in telling others to come hear the good news. The Messiah was in their midst, and he offers eternal life. That means Jesus is willing to use messed up, broken, sinful human beings like you and me too. He's willing to use, guys, he uses me. And if you know my past, Jesus, man, I, I don't know why I'm standing here today. <laughs> but he's not willing to just use me. He's willing to use you and you and you. He's willing to use all of us. It doesn't matter what our past is. He wants to use all of us for his glory and purpose. He thinks you're valuable. He doesn't care what you've done past. He knows. He's not excusing it, but he says, I'm going to do something new through you. And that's what Jesus does. He takes something messy, broken, he puts it back together, and he says, now, go live your life for the purpose I gave it. The Samaritan woman runs into the town to tell everyone about Jesus, and the townspeople, they are making their way towards Jesus now. Look at these next few passages. This is the last chunk for today. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? They don't get it. They think someone actually brought physical food. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. The disciples are a little slow, and I probably would have been too if I was in their shoes. They think Jesus is talking about physical food just like the Samaritan woman thought Jesus was talking about physical water. Jesus instead explains that his real hunger, his deepest longing, is satisfied when he does the work of his Father, bringing people to him for eternal life. Maybe it helps you to close your eyes. I don't know, but I want you to try to visualize this this morning. 
because this is pretty powerful. It includes you and I as Christians as we think about this. So try to visualize this with me, okay? As Jesus is telling his disciples all of this, the townspeople from Sychar, they are literally walking towards Jesus and his disciples who are still at the well. They're coming to learn more about Jesus. And I can see Jesus getting his disciples' attention. Hey, Peter, come over here. Hey, uh, James, come over here. And he's getting everyone to say, hey, look, he's getting their attention. He wants them to focus on the people that are now coming to them in groves. He makes sure all of them by now are looking at the crowd that are coming closer to him. There's something very important that he wants them to understand in this very moment as they watch people coming. And he tells the disciples, look at this field of people. They are ripe for a spiritual harvest. The time to give others the hope of eternal life is not in the future. It's now. Jesus says, I am doing everything that needs to be done for today and the future. To sow with them, each person, a desire for eternal life. It will now be your turn to harvest, to teach them how to be born again. And together will we rejoice for every soul that gains eternal life. We visualize that this morning because the same is true for you and I as we think about this. There are fields of people in our lives that we're looking at and rubbing shoulders with every single day. Will you go tell the fields of people here in Hampton? Will you go and tell the fields of people in Newport News about Jesus? Will you tell your neighbor, your friends, your family, your coworkers, your your kids, friends, parents, will you tell them about Jesus? Will you go beyond inviting them to church and actually instead invite them to something even richer, invite them into your life where they can see and test and investigate the Jesus you claim to worship every day? Will you choose to invite them into that? But you go beyond inviting them to the simple things of church, inviting them into your life. Like Jesus told his disciples back then, he's telling you and I today, the harvest is ripe. So don't delay, because there's no promise tomorrow. Start reaping today what he has sown, so that together we may rejoice in harvesting a crop for eternal life. We're going to close with a word of prayer, and we'll go into communion time. But as we talk about the fields of people that are in our lives, as we think about people we rub shoulders with at work or wherever, here's what I want you to do as we pray. Think of one person. One person in life you know and you see on a regular basis or talk with on a regular basis that they don't know Jesus. They do not follow him. If they died today, they would be in hell. We're going to pray for that one person that comes to your mind. I'm going to ask for you to pray for that person specifically as we get ready to close this morning, okay? Let me lead for us, and I'll give you an opportunity to pray for them, and I'll close this again in prayer. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and do that together. Jesus, you make it very clear what our purpose is when we sign up to follow you. Not only can we be grateful for the eternal life you give us, you then charge us with the most awesome responsibility of going and telling others about you so they also come into eternal life with you. That's what you want. You want as many people coming to you for eternity as possible. And so, Jesus... You choose to use us, messed up, broken people, to go and accomplish that. And while sometimes I scratch my head and I don't understand why would you use me, you still choose to. You choose to use all of us. And Jesus, right now we're thinking about that one person in this life that we know, we love, and we care about that does not know and follow you. And Jesus, we are praying for that person that they would choose to cling to you, that they would choose to be investigative of you, that they would choose to think about you. They would begin thinking about their greatest spiritual need, not ignoring it, not focusing on things on this earth, but instead start thinking about the fact they're going to die someday, and what does that mean afterwards? And Jesus, together as as a church family, we're going to pause for a moment, and I ask that all of us, we'd be praying for that one person right now for a few moments. Father, I know you hear our prayers. I know that you know what's going to happen with the person that's on our mind that we're praying about. We know that you know that they'll maybe one day choose to follow you, and you know maybe one day they won't. But Jesus, you know that also our goal is not to 
save someone, our goal is to tell them about how to be saved and how you've provided that way. And I pray that you would help us to be brave, courageous, being willing to initiate awkward conversations that turn into life-giving situations and conversations. And Jesus, I pray that you would give us the wisdom, the know-how to get into a person's heart and life and help them see that there's something greater than what they've been pursuing. And I pray, Jesus, for every single name and every image of person in our, in our, minds, our mind's eye right now, that they would choose to follow you. And how great that would be, Jesus, when they come into a saving relationship with you. And we can give you glory for that. There's work to be done, and the harvest is plentiful. But, Lord, you have to have those who are willing to go harvest it. And so I pray that you would help us, like your disciples, as we see those people in our lives, and we visualize them in our mind. That's the harvest. That, that's the person. Those are the people that need to know you. Jesus, would you please help us to be bold and lean on your Holy Spirit to guide us into conversations with those people that matter? I pray, Jesus, you would do a work in all of us. You would help us to do that, and you would bring them to salvation. And I pray you give us the courage to be the ones to be an agent of that as you use us to do your work for your glory. I pray that, Jesus, in your name. Amen. My story is so cool about the Samaritan woman. Like, it's us. Like, the people that have made a mess of their past, Jesus says, I know, but I still want you anyway. And that's the God we worship today. He doesn't ask us to clean everything up before we come to him. That's out there in our society. They think all you have to do, you have to clean everything up, and then you can come become a Christian. No, he says, take your broken messes, all your sin, bring it here. I already know about it. Let me help change you into the image I designed for you at the beginning of your creation. And so this morning, we get to think about what Jesus has done for us how he alone has made it possible for you and I to have eternal life. And we, when we read about eternity, we see in the book of Revelation that there will be no more death, no more mourning, no crying, no pain. All creation will be free from the reign and effects of sin. After observing all this, John, who has seen this vision in the future, he sees Jesus sitting on the throne declaring, Behold, I make all things new. Someday, folks, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to make everything new. And that's great news. But we, as excitedly as we wait that day, we see that right now, in preparation for that great day, Jesus is making us people new. He's refining you and me into the image of a son. He's taking people who don't care about Jesus to somebody who can't live and breathe without him. And he did that, and he makes that possible by going to the cross and dying it for yours and my sins. And this is Christianity 101, we know this, but the depths of his love for, to do that for you and I, we should never become numb to that. Not only is he making everything new and going to change it all for eternity, but he's making you and I new in a way that is eternally significant and important and life-giving. And we get to praise his name and say thank you for that. And it all started back on the cross. So this morning as you have that little piece of bread and that cup of juice, we remember his body beaten and broken for us his blood poured out for us because he wanted to begin doing a new work in you and me he knows our sins he doesn't care he still wants you and we thank him this morning for that take a moment now to take the bread to take the juice and thank him for his sacrifice on the cross making a way possible for you to become new have been here this morning, you've heard the message. Jesus wants you. Plain and simple. He's crazy about you. And he wants nothing more than a relationship with you that starts in this life and lasts for all of eternity. If that's something that you aren't guaranteed because you're not confident in what you've done with Jesus, man, let's talk about that. Let me take you out to lunch. Let me get you a cup of coffee. Let's come to my office. Let's, let's talk about the things that really matter most. At the same time, if you have earthly physical needs, then come talk to us about that too. We're a church family, so we get to be there in the harsh and the intense and the difficult and also in the joys of this life. But as a church family, we do it all together. 
And so I encourage you as we get ready to stand and sing this last song, if there's something you say like, hey, Nick, I could use prayer for this. Or I would want the church family to know so they could be praying for me about this. Or if you have the courage and you want to say, hey, can we go talk about this sometime? Come find me up front here. I'll be down here to meet you. But let's stand right now and let's stand and sing and worship our God and our Savior, the one who gives us life and makes us new. And let us uh, have an opportunity to worship one last time together. Let's do that now. I'll be down here up front to meet you if you have something you'd like to share.